Hi, I'm Ulf Liebeser. Have you ever seen the dance of the plankton? Those tiny creatures drifting in the sunlit surface layer of the sea? Their stage is the vast extent of the global ocean. Their choreography may seem complex, but it is conducted by only two environmental variables, sunlight and nutrients. Those two factors and their seasonal variability causes what can be called the dance of the plankton. And here we are seeing their choreography at a global scale. Just get the dimension of this animation. But first, let's understand how nutrients and light are controlled in the ocean, a watery expense so different from the land system we are familiar with. Then we will use this to come back to the animation and ask ourselves how this system is already under change and what we may expect in the future. To understand how nutrients and light control plankton growth, we need to descend into the sunlit surface layer of the ocean. So let's view a cross section of the upper ocean. The deep sea is replete in nutrients, but light doesn't penetrate much below about 30 meters. So phytoplankton mixed below that depth can use those abundant nutrients for growth. As the sun warms the surface, an increasingly stable surface layer traps the nutrients and the organisms close to the sunlit layer. Ideal conditions for growth. Phytoplankton rapidly use up the nutrients until these are at such low concentrations that growth is limited, and it is only the next period of deep mixing bringing in new nutrients which sets a new cycle of phytoplankton growth. So obviously, physical forces drive these cycles, and phytoplankton relies on the optimal combination of both factors, light and nutrients in concert. This simplified understanding can be applied to seasonal patterns of growth, but also to regional differences, for example, between polar and tropical areas. Think of the fluctuating cooling and warming in temperate areas, in training nutrients in strong seasonal cycles, each followed by a spurt of phytoplankton growth. In the tropics, in contrast, the surface is always so much warmer than the deeper layers that very little mixing takes place. Low nutrients, despite strong sunlight, give low productivity. If you've listened carefully, you'll be charmed at the realization that solar radiation drives not just the power of photosynthesis, but the physical forces that provide the conditions for growth. So now we can get back to the animation. What we see here is the seasonal succession of phytoplankton chlorophyll. Blue and purple means very low plankton abundances. Green shows high abundances. Do you see the plankton-rich areas expanding and contracting in the northern hemisphere almost in synchrony with the expansion and contraction of vegetation on land? The phytoplankton we see here form the base of the marine food web that supports all larger organisms. Green colors mean lots of food for fish, whales, and other mammals. Blue and purple means that there's not much to feed on. So who are the actors in the dancing chorus? They are single-celled microalgae, and to us, they appear all very tiny, most of them not even visible to the naked eye. And they come in staggering numbers. There are thousands of them in a drop of seawater, tens of millions in each liter of seawater. Although they all seem tiny to us, they span a size range identical to that between a fish and the city of Manhattan. Between the smallest and the largest phytoplankton, we see a thousand-fold size difference. And bear in mind, these are all single cells. The smallest phytoplankton, which are about one thousandth of a millimeter in diameter, are the dominant groups in nutrient-poor regions of the ocean. The large microalgae can outcompete the smaller ones when nutrients become more abundant. So not only do these regions differ in the amount of productivity, the phytoplankton players are different too. Now the point here is that it matters greatly 
for the ocean ecosystem, whether the phytoplankton food is at the lower end of the size range or whether the food comes in large chunks. Food webs built on the smallest phytoplankton take four to five steps to reach large fish. This is shown in the left column of this graph. On the other hand, if large phytoplankton are at the base of the food web, the number of trophic steps is reduced to two or three, as shown in the right panel. Now consider that only about 10% of the energy and matter is transferred from one trophic level to the next. This means that every step in the food web reduces its efficiency to one-tenth. So let's join these basic principles. In nutrient-rich, high-productive waters, where phytoplankton are large and form the base of the food web, 1% of the phytoplankton production ends up as harvestable fish. These are typically the areas in temperate regions where we find an amazing enrichment of biological production, and this is also where fishery harvest is the highest. On the other hand, in nutrient-poor open ocean areas, because of the much longer food webs, it is only one thousandth of that, 0.001%. So not only are these waters less productive, the transfer efficiency in the food web is also much lower. So next time you eat fish, think of where it comes from and what ecosystem has nourished it. Considering that fish is the primary animal protein source of one billion people, it is essential to us that the highly productive marine ecosystems stay productive also in the future ocean. So let's use what we've learned to see how climate change might impact ocean productivity. Observations show that due to climate change, the surface ocean is warming. This increases the vertical stability of the water column because as the water warms up, its density decreases. So lighter water sits on top of the heavier water underneath. As a result of this, it takes more energy, for example, more wind stress, to mix surface and deeper waters. Model studies predict that the impact of this on marine productivity will vary for different regions of the ocean as visualized in this sketch. In low to mid latitudes, warming reduces the mixing of nutrients into the upper layer. As a result of this, productivity decreases in these areas in the future ocean. Less nutrients and warmer temperatures are expected to also cause a shift from larger to smaller phytoplankton cells. Under future ocean conditions, low to mid latitudes may therefore be less productive and have more trophic steps to harvestable fish. Both effects work in the same direction, a decrease in fish production. In high latitudes, on the other hand, surface layer warming may work out to the benefit of the phytoplankton productivity. Because these waters are generally well mixed, nutrient supply is often not limiting phytoplankton growth. Instead, deep mixing causes phytoplankton to be light limited. Increased stability of these water columns will keep them closer to the sunlit surface. More light allows the phytoplankton to make better use of the abundant nutrients, so productivity in these areas may go up. Whether this balances out on a global scale is not so clear yet. But what it means is that the zonal distribution of productivity in the ocean will change, and with it, the trophic structure and food web efficiency. Whether we will still be able to catch the same amount of fish as today is one of the key questions to be concerned about. This global dance of the plankton, showing how life in the ocean responds to the cycles of physical forcing and the tremendous effects it has on marine ecosystems has always fascinated me. How will this change in the face of global change? And will the new choreography be sustainable to the ocean ecosystems that provide resources to humans? The answer is, we don't know, at least not at the moment. The concepts we've learned are, of course, simplified, 
and ocean scientists are still unraveling the immense complexity of life in the ocean. But while we continue to do that, we still wonder at the beauty and incredible diversity of life in the largest ecosystem on our planet, the pelagic ocean.